Are video games art? I'm willing to bet I know your answer to this. If the algorithm pushed this video to you, or you're a subscriber of the channel, you would probably answer this question with a resounding yes. However, anyone who's been plugged into video game history and culture for any reasonable amount of time will know that not everyone holds this opinion. In fact, some people turn their nose at the idea of video games being considered art. At the end of the day, this medium is the new kid on the block, the underdog at the art and entertainment table. Video games have been fighting an uphill battle for decades, often seen as base and lowbrow entertainment at best, and the scapegoat for acts of violence and cruelty at worst. As the landscape evolves, video games become a staple of more and more households. With the advent of technology like cloud gaming, subscription services like Microsoft Game Pass, and widespread internet connectivity, video games are slowly capturing more and more eyeballs worldwide. I'm going to, again, make some assumptions about you, the viewer, and go out on a limb and say that while you may be happy video games are becoming more and more popular, you're probably conflicted about the types of video games that emerge as most popular. I'm talking about the half-baked, unfinished releases. I'm talking about the regurgitation of yearly franchises. I'm talking about mobile games designed from the ground up to extract as much discretionary income out of their target audience as possible. To the average person, these are the types of games that represent the medium. For every God of War, there are dozens of gambling simulators reskinned in whatever licensed property the publishers could get their grubby hands on. For every Red Dead 2, there are a dozen live-service looter shooters with repetitive gameplay loops and gear that only serves to increase stats. And it sucks. We deeply care about the medium of video games and want to see inspired, thoughtful, and well-polished games celebrated. But time after time, a lot of these games are only landing within the core gaming audience, which represents a relatively small part of overall market share. My point being, while video games are much more popular than they were, say, 30 years ago, they still don't have the same sort of prestige that books, movies, and fine art do. What if you were put into a position where you had to convince someone that video games are indeed art? What game would you show them? I know you've got one in mind. Maybe it's Dark Souls? Journey? Limbo? Silent Hill? For me, it is and probably always will be, Hollow Knight. To begin seeing Hollow Knight's merits as a piece of art, perhaps we should start with the legitimate art of the title. Hollow Knight is the brainchild of Australian developers Ari Gibson and William Pellin, the former of which is responsible for the majority of Hollow Knight's visual style and animation. The hand-drawn art was one of the most notable aspects of Hollow Knight when it launched on Kickstarter in 2014. And you can see here that it is absolutely astounding. Everything from the background art, to the character design, to the animation, it's all top-notch. The art is impressive on its own, but collects even more merit when you realize just how diverse the art across the game is. Look at the difference between the rugged melancholy of Dirtmouth, to the lush forests of Greenpath, to the elegant loneliness of the City of Tears. These three areas represent merely 20% of Hollow Knight's map, and the remaining 80% are just as diverse and unique. Besides the environments, all the characters and creatures you encounter are always changing. The kingdom of Hollow Nest is inhabited by… bugs. On the surface, not the most exciting concept, but the developers pull this off so well. From flies, to spiders, to bees, to beetles, Hollow Knight refreshes itself constantly as you come across a wide variety of environments and enemies. All the art of Hollow Knight culminates into giving this setting such a distinct sense of place. The feelings you get when exploring Hollow Nest shift from curious, to melancholy, to lonely, to awestruck. There's not much out there like it. Hollow Nest is one of the most interesting settings in video games, and that's thanks in large part to the art. Ultimately, the visuals and animation represent only half of the game's presentation. The other half is the music and auditory ambience of Hollow Knight. The question is, does the audio landscape of Hollow Knight live up to the visuals? Well, I'll let you decide. The music you'll hear while exploring Hollow Nest is nearly inseparable from their locations in the game. 
everything's matched perfectly to the point where now, after completing Hollow Knight, whenever I see a forest or anything colored lush green, I subconsciously hear Green Path in my head. For my money, the best track in the game is City of Tears. It starts to play when you reach the capital city of the kingdom. Now, I want to set the scene here to make sure those of you who haven't played understand the full context. Up to this point, we've been exploring pretty rustic and flora-dominant locations. The aforementioned green path, the gravelly forgotten roads, and the fungal wastes. A player who's been paying attention will remember mentions of the great city that lies at the heart of the kingdom, whether it be from NPCs we meet or from shrines we read along our journey. Eventually, we find our way into the city, fighting our way out of the fungal wastes and through the first line of guards that defend the streets of the City of Tears. We finally find a moment of respite, descend into the next area, and come across this. It's our friend, Quarrel, who we've seen a few times before, and a bench where we can rest and save our progress. Now, just take a moment to soak all this in. This moment right here encapsulates the magic of Hollow Knight more than any words could. If you could distill the beauty of Hollow Knight down into one single moment, this is what it would be. But let's not get carried away here, sure, audially, visually, Hollow Knight is great. But remember, this is a video game. Does it have any merit in that regard? Is Hollow Knight even fun to play? I'll answer that question with a question. Do games have to play well to be considered art? Obviously fucking not. Red Dead Redemption 2 controls like Arthur Morgan is covered in molasses, and the gameplay doesn't meaningfully evolve from the first hour to the 80th. It's art, but man, not the most fun game to play. What remains of Edith Finch, Firewatch, Death Stranding are all ostensibly walking simulators, yet these are some of the most prevalent titles in the games as art discussion. Yes, I like Death Stranding Fight Me. On the other hand, there are games that, well, you know what, I don't want to come off as a pretentious asshole because the medium of video games itself deserves the title of art, but um, I'm just going to come out and say NBA 2K is not an avant-garde video game. However, it is a really fucking fun basketball game. The core gameplay loop of 2K is amazing. It's the stuff that surrounds the on-court action that give these games such a bad reputation in the industry. Y you see what I'm saying? I would never be such a dick to say that NBA 2K or Madden or FIFA isn't art. It's just that I think the developers prioritized making a kick-ass sports game over making a game that ponders the existence of humanity. Point being, gameplay is not indicative of a game's merits as a piece of art. As long as you are interacting with the piece in a way that's unique to video games, it is a video game, and therefore, it is art. It just so happens, Hollow Knight is a kick-ass video game. When you start your journey in Hollow Knight, you'll be a timid little thing. You'll reluctantly swing your nail, keeping your distance from every threat in the game. You'll very methodically hop from platform to platform, unsure of your own judgment and coordination. However, through a combination of self-mastery and acquiring new abilities, you'll claim your rightful place as the Scourge of Hallownest, vanquishing foes with ease and navigating the labyrinthian passageways with fierce efficiency and speed never seen before. But this isn't even the best part of Hollow Knight's gameplay. Platforming is great fun, sure. You can sequence break the hell out of this game if you know what you're doing. And as stated before, there are a wide variety of enemies with unique attack patterns and strategies ensuring combat never gets old. But the best part of Hollow Knight's core gameplay are the incredible boss fights. Mantis Lords, Hornet, Grim, all these fights are some of my favorite ever, irrespective of the game. When this shit is clicking, it's like you're locked in a deadly ballet with your foes. They've got the thing going on that the best boss fights have, where the first few times you face them it feels legitimately impossible. But as you slowly learn attack patterns, you feel like a god overcoming a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. 
Learning Hollow Knight's gameplay and mastering it is such a joy. The eye and ear candy is great, but even if the presentation was half as good, I would still be compelled to search every nook and cranny of this game, squeezing every last ounce of gameplay I could out of it. A huge part of my desire to stay in this world is because Hollow Nest is so expertly designed, it makes my head spin. There's this moment from the first Dark Souls that everyone loves to jerk, myself included. You probably already know what it is, but on the off chance you don't, it involves this elevator. Up to this point, the player has been exploring the seemingly unknowable Undead Burg, a complex fortress of cobblestone ramparts and towers. If you've made it this far, you've probably struggled hard, slogging your way past the hordes of undead that occupy the Burg, the Black Knight, the Taurus Demon, and the dreaded Hellkite Dragon. We've been conditioned to always expect the worst, so seeing this elevator fills us with a strange mix of optimism and dread. Maybe this will lead us to a boss fight we are not prepared for. Maybe it will lead us to a helpful NPC. Maybe it will lead us to our next bonfire. We're so far gone from where we started in the Fire Link Shrine below. You want any chance you can, even for a moment of respite. So, expecting the worst yet hoping for the best, we inch our way forward. Our shield is up, our sword is at the ready. Slowly, we step onto the elevator. The gears click and whir as we descend downward. Whatever vile beast lies in wait below, we are prepared to vanquish with the- Holy shit, it leads back to Firelink Shrine? Turns out, our journey didn't take us as far as we thought, because to our surprise, the elevator has led us to the very place we started this entire slog up the berg. There's a reason this is so well remembered. It flexes the developer's world design muscles. FromSoft, from here on out, would become known for their interconnected game worlds. But they would never really top this moment right here. There are multiple moments in Hollow Knight that are just as good as the elevator ride to Firelink Shrine and Dark Souls. This is the map of Hollow Knight. It's so incredibly vast for what this game appears to be on the surface. This isn't a quaint little indie platformer that takes 10 hours to beat. This is a sprawling mega-adventure you could play for over 100 hours if you're looking to see and do everything. It's not just the way that Hollow Nest connects together that makes it so special. It's the way it's presented that gives it an extra edge over most other games of this type. Take, for instance, the aforementioned City of Tears. It's always raining. When first encountered, you may just assume this is an aesthetic choice, and it is, but it's not only that. Explore some more and you'll discover that the Blue Lake sits directly above the City of Tears, and the runoff from this lake is what causes the city to be always raining. Another way Hollow Knight masters the art of ecology and world design is the way it portrays the space between. When you're moving from area to area, there are never sharp changes in tone. It's always gradual, teasing what's ahead by slowly transforming the landscape around you. So, why would I choose this game as the prime example of video games as art? Honestly, I don't know. It's not more artful than any other titles that come to mind when you think about this subject. Is it even fair to compare Hollow Knight to something like Red Dead 2? Even when not looking in this space, it would be incredibly pretentious of us to say that Hollow Knight is more artful than something like the aforementioned NBA 2K. Sure, we've established that 2K and some other yearly sports franchises have some qualities about it that aren't great. We've established that the developers probably weren't trying to make any grand observations about the state of the world when developing the game. However, when you look at it through the lens of a basketball simulation, it is incredibly artful. When you aren't experiencing any game-breaking glitches, predatory microtransactions, or playing against some 12-year-old troll with nothing better to do than repeatedly drive the baseline with Miami Heat LeBron James in 2K13, really showing my age with that one, what you're playing is maybe the best, most sincere love letter to the game of basketball that we've ever seen. Just a thought, maybe? No, that's not true. That title goes to NBA Street Volume 2, and this explores a whole other rabbit hole that really has no relevance to this video. I think if you're here, you know that game developers are usually super passionate about the projects they're working on. It's the publishers and the suits that turn these things into basketball-themed pachinko machines. The point I'm trying to make, all the developers who work on 2K and put their blood, sweat, and tears into making the most true-to-life basketball simulator we've ever seen, do they not deserve just as much credit as Team Cherry does for making Hollow Knight? So, when I tell you Hollow Knight is my personal prime example of games as art, this isn't to detract from any other video game, no matter what its intentions are. Hollow Knight just is special. 
is that so much staying power. People are frothing at the mouth for Silk Song, which I hope and pray comes out this year. Please, there are other Metroidvanias out there. There are other platformers. There are other games with vague and interesting lore. There are other games with great boss fights. There are other games with amazing art styles and great music. It's hard for me to put my finger on exactly what I mean when I say Hollow Knight is art. Every time I get to this part in the script, I scrap it and rewrite, so you know what? Fuck it. We're going off script. Here's me spitballing on why I think Hollow Knight is art. Um, um, I think maybe part of the reason that Hollow Knight is so artful is it, it, would, it would have to be a mix of the gameplay mixed with the world and lore.